modern science obviously recognizes that there are many more than two biological sexes. The classic narcissist is easy to see. He's grandiose. He brags. But he's not the only kind. The covert narcissist is wily and camouflaged and dangerous. She's a spiritual worker, a doctor, a nurse, someone who toils night and day for others under a burden of emotional pain that no mere mortal could shoulder. Fairy tales give us the image of the wolf in sheep's clothing, and that's what the covert narcissist is. We're going to peel off the costume and look at the ravenous face of the fragile narcissist this week on Disaffected. Welcome to Disaffected. I'm Joshua Slocum, coming to you this week live. Well, we're not actually live, but I just wanted to say that from an undisclosed and extremely boring location. <laughs> not as boring as the president's speech, and we'll get to that. But we have some goodies for you first. Um, well, first, let me tell you about what this show is about if this is the first time you've watched it. The thesis of this show is that we are living in a time where culturally and politically traits from personality disorders, cluster B personality disorders, are structuring our conversations, our culture, our arts, and our politics. Um, five years ago, when I woke up to the disordered character that my mother had, my mother has borderline and narcissistic personality disorders, and she and her children have been locked in an abusive relationship for our entire lives. I finally woke up to what was wrong there in 2016, and I very quickly started to notice that the same kinds of mind games, misrepresentations, and false victim claims uh, that I was used to seeing from my mother were happening everywhere on the left. And I, I introduce this show and I often say the social justice left, and unfortunately it's not just the social justice left anymore that is acting like a clinical narcissist or an unstable borderline. It seems to be the mainstream left as well. This has taken over everything. What was woke a year ago is uh, is today considered just quite a quite normal plank uh, for voters in the Democratic Party. Um, if you want a foundation in why this show started and what the details of some of the cluster B disorders are, look at episodes one and two. The first episode is called Mommy Issues, The Origin Story, and the second episode is called Don't Diagnose. And it's in that episode where I talk about the pushback that people who talk about personality disorder characteristics and abuse dynamics often get. People say, don't diagnose, you're not a doctor. And this is really just a uh, polite way of saying, shh, shut up keep the secret. So, goodies for you guys. We have a website now. Go to disaffected.fm. That's disaffected.fm. And some of you have been asking, thank you very much, those of you who have signed up to contribute to us. We really appreciate it. We're a small fledgling show and every bit helps. Uh, some of you have asked for alternative ways to contribute aside from Patreon. Subscribestar is in the works. We've got it going. We're waiting approval. We did hear you and we are taking action. Thank you. Uh, we also have PayPal now. You can find all of this at disaffected.fm. All of our contribution links are there. All of the links to where you can get us on audio. And I forget to say this sometimes. Thank you for subscribing. Please do subscribe on whatever platforms you're on, whether it's video or audio, hopefully both, but also hit the like button. Give us a rating, please. That really actually helps us. Um, so there are a couple of blog posts up there. We're still building it out, uh, but take a look at it. And I'm going to talk about a couple of the things that I wrote on the blog on today's show. And this week, we're going to talk about covert narcissism, also called fragile narcissism, or introverted narcissism. I call it covert narcissism in this undisclosed location. We also have earpieces, so sorry that you have to watch me digging around here, but this thing needs to get tucked back in. <laughs> um, as I talk about this, you are going to, uh, those of you who are a little bit clued in to Cluster B, um, and for those of you who aren't, the cluster B personality disorders are borderline personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, histrionic personality disorder, and antisocial personality disorder, or psychopathy. 
These are mental illnesses that are not quite like the mental illnesses you're familiar with. They're not things like depression or anxiety that might come on and impinge on somebody who's otherwise normally stable. These are ingrained, longstanding, and consistent patterns of personality, character, mood, and relating to other people that are fundamentally distorted. So when I talk about COVID and our <laughs> COVID narcissism. <laughs> well, I guess we are going to talk about COVID narcissism. But in covert narcissism, you are going to see some overlap with what looks to you like borderline personality disorder. Um, and I'm not I'm not really sure that that means that that these are two disorders that overlap or if it may be more accurate to say that these are different expressions of the same fundamental psychopathology. I've not yet decided on whether there really are four discrete cluster B disorders or whether the base problem is what we call cluster B and that everybody picks from a different menu, some from borderline, some from antisocial. That may be the case too. So yes, there is going to be some overlap with borderline personality disorder. But before we get to that, I I, <laughs> I don't have very much to say about President Joe Biden's speech. Um, I think the best way to describe it was a comment I saw come across social media, boring and radical. I think it's probably the best way to describe it. And I guess it wasn't actually his State of the Union. It was his first address to a, a joint session of Congress. He didn't do a State of the Union in, in February like most presidents have done before. And as always, the party that is not in power, the opposition party, this being the Republicans, they usually have a response to the president's speech. So Senator Tim Scott uh, was chosen to give the response to Joe Biden's speech, and he objected to what President Biden said, um, characterizing the country as um, having foundational institutional racism problems. He objected on a lot of grounds. But you see this. Um, I see this, and I hope you're seeing it now, too. A few years ago, when I was still a Democrat, a left-leaning voter, um, I had to get used to the fact that I needed to listen to a lot of people who I had written off before. And I remember, oh gosh, going back 15, 20 years, log cabin Republicans, the gay Republicans, right? Oh, they were just horrible. What's wrong with those guys? They're just self-hating. They have internalized homophobia. They really wish they were straight and they're just trying to suck up to their bullies uh, because they're ashamed of being gay. Well, I was wrong. There may be some of that. You know, there's some of that in most groups of people. Um, and I don't call myself a Republican. I don't call myself a conservative, a liberal, or a libertarian. Uh, the closest I think I could come to would be a term that is used more frequently in the UK, classical liberalism. Um, but people are saying the same things about black Republicans and black conservatives. They want to smear them. They want to say that there's something deranged about them, that they can't think straight, that they are operating on internalized racism and just repeating the, um, the things that white people want them to say. So let's put up a tweet here from Senator Tim Scott. And he said, I want to have an honest conversation about common sense and common ground, about how we move forward together. I know, I know you're you're looking at the sausage being made right now, this earpiece fiddling. I'm sorry, but uh, it's staying in. You're just going to have to deal with it. <laughs> so I want to have an honest conversation about common sense and common ground, about how we move forward together. Now let's go on to my favorite response to Tim Scott. Cheryl Dunn. I have no idea who Cheryl Dunn is, but taking a look at her picture, she's just a nice grandmotherly lady, isn't she? What did she have to say? Hi, Uncle Tim. How does it feel to spread disinformation and be a traitor to your race and to your country? Uncle Tim. If you're not familiar with this kind of language, and I know some of you are listening from outside the United States, thank you very much. This is a reference to the accusation that a black person is an Uncle Tom from the famous um, novel Uncle Tom's Cabin. A traitor. A race traitor. How in hell did we get to the point where a black senator 
a grown, educated man who has a different point of view from the conventional view that people think black people in the United States are supposed to have. How did we get to the point where people like Cheryl Dunn are confident, confident in coming out on social media and saying, how does it feel to be a race traitor? Uncle Tim? The chutzpah is astonishing. It's, it's, it's absolutely astonishing. And this is why this is why I pay attention to the way people present themselves. You've heard me talk on up other episodes before about visual tells that people give off uh, that sometimes can help you to suss out what kind of person they are, whether they're going to be pleasant or quarrelsome, whether they're conventional or non-conventional. And yes, sometimes, you know, whether they're likely to be narcissistic and, and, and dangerous. And it astonishes me how many of the people like Cheryl present this smiling, well-groomed, um, open and inviting image. Hi, Uncle Tim. Hi, Uncle Tim. That's what I expect, right? That there's just barely concealed rage, contempt, and disdain underneath these smiling faces. And this has a lot to do with covert narcissism. We're going to get into covert narcissism in detail in segment two, but I want to offer you a couple of other things first in the beginning of the show. So on the new blog on disaffected.fm, I fleshed out some conversation that some conversations that I was having with friends on social media. Uh, I've come up with a couple of terms for common behaviors that manipulative people use. Uh, that often fool people into believing that they are victims or that they have been hard done by or that they are a knight in shining armor, or a hero or a heroine. And one of them um, I call briar patching. If you find this helpful, feel free to adopt it. What is briar patching? Comes from the folk tale of Br'er Rabbit, um, who when he's being chased, and now I can't remember for the life of me what the other animals were who were chasing poor Br'er Rabbit. Um, but he was being chased and he figured out that he could escape if he could convince his pursuers to throw him into the briar patch, into a, a nest of thorns and nettles that he could wriggle out of, but that they could not wriggle out of. So he said, oh, oh, please don't throw me in the briar patch. Oh, if anything, please, please don't throw me in the briar patch. It's my worst fear. Help, help, help. So, of course, they threw him right into the briar patch and he wriggled out and got away. A lot of people do briar patching. And an example of this um, came up this week with the actress Ellen Page, excuse me, Elliot Page, who like everybody else who wants to be a victim for fame and money, um, went to Oprah. And I watched about three minutes of this insipid, maudlin tear fest, uh, her conversation with Oprah Winfrey. And the advertisements for this interview, so, okay, so it's Ellen Page, who is an actress that if anybody knows who she is, they know her from a movie at least 15 years ago, 10, 15 years ago called Juno. Um, about a pregnant girl who decided not to have an abortion. And she has recently decided, she came out a few years ago as a lesbian, to absolutely no one's surprise. But that wasn't enough. Now she's a man. She's trans. So she goes to talk to Oprah, and all the headlines and advertisements about this are Ellen Page felt compelled to talk about the horrible backlash that's happening to transgender people and especially transgender youth. She had to tell her story to the world. You know, she's sacrificing herself so that everybody else can live more freely or something like that. And this is an example of, of briar patching. They say they don't want this terrible thing to happen, but they do, in fact, want this terrible thing to happen. And if no terrible thing is happening, they will create a terrible thing. And that's what Ellen Page has done. She talks to Oprah Winfrey about the uh, rash of anti-transgender youth bills that are sweeping across the country. And what is she talking about? Common sense, ordinary, sensible measures in state legislatures 
that would require public school children to compete in sports based on their biological sex. Is that shocking to you? It shouldn't be because that's the way it's always been. This is, we are now at the point where we have to go to state legislatures and write laws that say boys can't compete on the girls team. And it's always one way, it's always boys going on to the, excuse me, trans girls, trans girls. It's always one way. We're not seeing so-called trans boys, that is biological females, very often trying to compete on the boys team because they know they'll get their asses kicked. This is biological reality. Men and women are different. Boys and girls are different. And once adolescence starts and the cascade of hormones that develops our secondary sex characteristics, that increases our sexual desire, gets us ready to mate and reproduce, um, when those things happen, the difference between the sexes widens immeasurably, not immeasurably, but, uh, but irreversibly, right? You can't go through a male puberty and then as, as so-called trans women claim, and then take feminizing um, estrogen and hormones and somehow lose the greater lung capacity, the greater bone density, the greater number of fast twitch muscle fibers that male bodies develop. There is a reason why even the top female athletes in things like tennis could easily be beaten um, by medi uh, boys of mediocre competence uh, once they've gone through adolescence. So it's always in one direction. It's always the boys, trans girls, um, wanting to be validated um, by going on the girls' sports teams. And this is briar patching because it's what people like Ellen Page want. It's what trans activists want. People talk about there being a, um, you know, that we're in a culture war. Can we have a truce in the culture war? Can we have a compromise? We can't because the opponents on the other side of this, they want this to be a forever war because they don't want a world of sunshine and lollipops and rainbows and puppies. They don't actually want to get to the other side of the war where they can live freely and contentedly because they're doing this for narcissistic supply. Narcissistic supply is a term that we use for basically what we used to call egotism. It's when somebody who has a strong narcissistic interest in being gratified, being, being praised, being seen as special, being better than everybody else, they're getting narcissistic supply by being a victim. And that's where covert narcissism and camouflaged and introverted narcissism becomes more important to talk about because it's easy to see the flagrant narcissists, right? Take a Donald Trump, right? He's an image of the classic grandiose narcissist, right? It's all about him. He's the greatest. He's the smartest. He's the richest. He's, it's a walking caricature, right? It's a textbook example of classic grandiose narcissism. Covert narcissism is different. Covert narcissism cloaks itself in fragility, in victimhood, and often in an aura of saintly altruism. Often the people who claim that they are doing the most and more than anybody else to fight for the underdog are really doing this for narcissistic gratification. They don't want the war to end. We can't have a truce with them. We can't have a compromise with them because they don't want the war activity to stop. It will not stop until we put a stop to it and we put boundaries up. If we let them, they will drag this on forever and they will ratchet it up tighter and tighter and tighter. <sighs> There's another thing. I'm going to take you back to where we were last week um, when we talked about starting your day with Maximum Gay, Kellogg's with their deep purple, together with Pride, um, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender branded cereal box for children. This is an example of what I call candy cottaging. And yes, you dirty Brits out there, and particularly you, Rachel and Dennis, <laughs> I know exactly what you're thinking, and I know exactly what the word cottaging means in Great Britain. This is 
No, it's not a family show, but I'm going to say it. This is a family show and I'm not going to explain it to people, uh, but it doesn't mean that in the U.S. What I mean when I say candy cottaging is um, an image from Hansel and Gretel. Everybody knows the story. Um, father and stepmother take Hansel and Gretel out into the woods um, and tell them to go play by themselves. Mommy and daddy are going to go cut wood and do whatever it is that that fairy tale parents do, aside from abusing and neglecting and abandoning their children. Um, and Hansel and Gretel get lost and they come across the witch's candy cottage. I'm telling you folks, fairy tales, they're not just they're not light entertainment. There's a reason why Dr. Christine Ann Lawson, who wrote the book Understanding the Borderline Mother that I talked about a few episodes ago, there's a reason why she used fairy tale archetypes to describe the different phases and the different affects uh, that mothers with borderline personality disorder take on when they abuse their children, the waif, the hermit, the witch, and the queen. These are classic fairy tale archetypes because fairy tales are not light entertainment. They're actually, most of them have their origin in, in folk tales, but also as a form of moral instruction for children, a warning of danger. Original fairy tales before they get um, Disney-fied up are often quite gruesome and grisly. Sometimes the children die, and sometimes it's because of the wicked father or the wicked stepmother. Um, so fairy tales get to some very fundamental truths about human nature and the ways that humans fool each other. And candy cottaging is the way that some people fool other people for nefarious ends. Using the bright colors, the, the purple, the rainbow colors. It also it reminds me of what we talked about a couple of episodes ago with the infantilization of adult activities or adults who dress themselves up, either literally dress themselves up as 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 characters, cartoon characters, furries, the sexualized um, sort of costume subculture, the language that people use, it's infantilization. It's it's a camouflage. It's it's a mask of innocent fragility, so that you won't be skeptical and you will not question a predator who is trying. It's wolf in sheep's clothes that sheep's clothing that's what it is it's the wolf in sheep's clothing so that's candy cottaging briar patching and candy cottaging watch out for these you see it all over the place and i want to talk about one other thing i know i know i'm fiddling a lot it's just going to be that way um before we take a break here i talked earlier in earlier shows about how i used to be a member of the new atheist community, the group of people who are interested in church state separation issues, secularism, uh, particularly people who are fighting the battle uh, against creationism being taught in schools. When Richard Dawkins' book, The God Delusion, came out in 2006, a group of people came together and formed a community. They were called the New Atheists, and they took a more aggressive uh, and oppositional stance and said, This is a secular country, the United States. Um, and we should not be teaching school children things like creationism or the euphemism that they used for it called intelligent design. Um, and I was very much a part of that movement. I hung around with the people there. I read the same blogs they did. I left page after page of comments for years and years in these communities and on message boards and bulletin boards. And it took me a very long time to see that it I don't know if it was this way when it started, but by the time I left it, it had become a full-fledged cult. Uh, and if you object to that, and a lot of people do, they'll say, you know, well, it's cult-like, but there isn't one singular leader. And that's true. Um, Richard Dawkins was a figurehead, of course, um, in this movement, but the social justice movements often don't have one singular charismatic leader. It seems to rotate around, right? Different people wear the hat or different people venerate, you know, one spokesperson for Black Lives Matter or for the trans community uh, for the, or for the indigenous community. But in every other way, these communities have become cult-like. They have dogma that you cannot question. The very fact that you want to ask a question is treated with at least suspicion and more frequently with hostility. Um, 
And I should have seen some of this in the new atheist community when I was there, but I didn't. And I didn't fully wake up from this until around the same time that I had a revelation about what was wrong with my mother psychiatrically, that she was not in fact a fragile victim. She wasn't needy, she was aggressive, she was disordered and abusive. And she did mean to hurt people, including her children. She meant to exploit them. Um, but looking back on it, there were tells all over the place. And I was talking with somebody recently who is coming out of it a little bit later than I did. And and she's, she's feeling hurt. Um, she's feeling disillusioned. She's feeling frightened and she's feeling hurt. These are all normal. Um, the feeling of betrayal that you that you experience when you leave these communities and you realize that the people that you had put so much stock in as moral and ethical actors are, are in fact not moral and ethical the way you think they are, it hurts. And it also hurts because you are at the same time awakening to your own naivete and your own active complicity in this, right? So it's tough. It takes some time to get used to it. You will get used to it, though, if you're coming out of it. But she said, um, I don't remember who exactly she was talking about, but she said, I, I can't believe that so-and-so turned out to be so self-centered, so vain, um, so, so mean, uh, so likely to throw somebody else under the bus. What happened to him? What happened to him? Nothing happened to him. He didn't become vain. He didn't turn into a bad person. He didn't suddenly change his character. It's that the blinders are coming off your eyes. And this is what covert narcissism does. It blinds us, right? You can see the classic narcissist coming. You can see the guy who swaggers into the bar with his chin jutting out, bragging about the new uh, Lexus he bought, the new gold jewelry he has, how he constantly has to be the center of attention. He brags about himself all the time. It's easy to see these people. And in many ways, you know, I mean, some people are just more vainglorious than other people, but I'm talking about people who, who would actually fit the criteria for full-on narcissistic personality disorder. I think that the classic grandiose narcissist is probably less dangerous to you than the covert narcissist because you can see him coming. The covert narcissist is more subtle. And I'll give you an example. Loosely based on things that might have happened in real life, let's pretend that there was somebody who wanted to make a name for himself and wanted to be an up and coming writer and an up and coming speaker in the atheist community. Let's say that, let's say that he called himself the affable agnostic. And his whole brand and his whole persona was about being approachable and friendly. And let's say that he had some promotional photographs done, some headshots, nice big toothy smile. How are you? I'm very friendly, how are you? I'm the affable agnostic, how are you? I'm affable, how are you? I'm so affable, how are you? Mm. These kinds of people don't turn into someone else. They were always who they were. They weren't when they were children, of course, as, as somebody pointed out to me in this conversation. Most of the time, children don't start out this way. There does seem to be some evidence that um, there are thankfully rare examples, but I, I, I think I've seen them myself and I'm, I, I believe that this is true. I think that some children sadly are born bad seeds. There are some psychopaths who are born, um, but they are rare. The vast majority of people who turn out to have these personality disorders uh, do so because they were raised inadequately, they were neglected or they were abused. Many of these people really do have a history of trauma and abuse. It may not necessarily be florid, violent, physical abuse like what happened in my household or, you know, some of the even more extreme stories I've heard from other people where they had parents who actually prostituted them as children. It doesn't have to be that graphic. Uh, but these people started out 
as as regular children and were molded by neglect and abuse and 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 faulty parenting into the personality disordered broken people that they are um so if you have been if you are waking up if you are coming out of a social justice community and you are looking around at some of the people that you considered heroes and saying what happened to her i used to love her and then she did this I used to really look up to him, but then I saw him do this to a former friend. Part of me wants to say whatever gets you through the night, but another part of me says, no, what gets you through the night makes a difference. Most of the time, these people didn't change. You just didn't see who they were. And that's okay. I didn't see through a lot of these people either but they didn't change. There's no such thing as a person who grows all the way to adulthood, who is a normal, stable person, not a perfect person, maybe a short-tempered person, um, maybe a uh, maybe a more vain person than average, maybe, um, maybe more whiny than average. We all have our, our character flaws, right? But a normal person, they don't suddenly become a narcissist or an unstable borderline sometime in adulthood. That's not how it works. This, he didn't change. She didn't change. Nothing happened to him. Nothing happened to her. Something happened to you. You started to wake up. You put your foot wrong. One day when you were sitting at the pub with your group of friends and -and so-and-so was holding court and you didn't laugh quickly enough at her joke, or you didn't jump to do exactly what he said at a conference you did you you did a misstep and you didn't perfectly satisfy this person's narcissistic demands and ego demands and you started to see behind their mask something happened to you come back and we'll talk more about covert narcissism after the break would you take just a minute right now and share our show on social media On Disaffected, we take a close look every week at the abuse dynamics exploding in the dark and disordered world that we live in. Tell other people about us. Want to talk back to us? You're in luck. Call our listener line and leave us a message. 202-979-2480. That's 202-979-2480. And remember, we do reserve the right to play messages on the air. Welcome back. When I was preparing for this show, I looked around at a number of articles that talked about covert narcissism, and um, I found one that I I think is is really right on the money. And also, uh, although it was written before the pandemic started, is um, really well suited to describing the sorts of histrionic, narcissistic, faux altruistic behaviors that are everywhere in this pandemic. So this article is called The Virtuous Narcissist. It was written on Medium. The author is a social worker named uh, Sherry Heller. I don't know any more about her. I think I've read a couple of different pieces by her, uh, but this is worth reading. So if you, it's called The Virtuous Narcissist, What Lurks Behind the Heroic Mask. I wanna read to you a few excerpts from this. Amara touted herself as a spiritual healer versed in sundry esoteric techniques such as holographic resonance and cathartic release work. She seemed wise and encouraging. It took me years to see the backstabbing egomaniac that lurked beneath her mystical New Age facade. By the time I woke up to the truth, I was privy to the way she smeared my name to clients that I sent her way, and I recognized how her, quote, inspirational mentorship was designed to disempower me. When she attempted to lure me back in with her seductive overtures of contrition, I refused to be baited. It was a hard lesson finally learned after a decade of friendship. I'm betting that some of that behavior sounds familiar to you. The kind of people, my friend Lisa calls these people 
people who need to be needed. They are people that you often find in, in the human services field, in nonprofit work, in volunteer work, or in, well, frankly, in a lot of new age circles. It's a, a very, uh, this is a very, it's a very female typical expression of narcissism. This kind of covert narcissism is very female typical. Um, men do it too, and I've got some examples for you here today. But as like I said last week, this is a very feminized kind of narcissism. People tend, people, all of us, right? They're, they're not any different. People tend to express themselves in ways and through roles that are socially available to them based on who they are. And when this comes down to, to questions of male and female, uh, and I'm not saying, of course, that the differences between men and women, um, I don't know the degree to which they're inborn, the degree to which they are uh, acculturated through socialization. I think it's a mixture of both. But the roles available to the sexes are in some ways stereotyped and people act out their personalities through these stereotyped roles. So you see a lot of women. Um, if you're looking for female narcissists, look no further than new age communities and new age spiritual instructors, because it's a perfect way to cloak yourself in, as they say, love and light and enlightenment and contentment and 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 a state of of you know that you've reached a higher plane and you're now going to teach other people there's a lot of egotistical gratification to be had by being a guru this way um and these are people who i used to be very vulnerable to not necessarily the the spiritual new age types i was i i I've never really been that much into religion or spirituality personally. Um, but the helpers, the healers, the mother hens, right? <clears throat> I fell for this stuff. And Sherry Heller's article helps explain why. Another excerpt. Those like myself who were groomed in childhood to be narcissistic supply desperately sought to break the insidious pattern of falling prey to malignant narcissists. Catch that there. I'm breaking away from the story for a second. Notice that she's drawing that distinction between what she calls them the malignant narcissists. Um, but I think she's referring that has overlap with what I call the classic grandiose narcissist. Not all grandiose narcissists are malignant and, 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 um, but she's talking about the difference between the hidden and the one who's obvious. In spite of our efforts, we inevitably traversed a torturous phase of recovery in which we attracted the more polished, seemingly altruistic, special, successful, even spiritual narcissists. <laughs> more. Caught up in fastidiously weeding out the blatant signs of narcissism, such as smear campaigns, character assassination, and incessant lies, we lost sight of the subtle, nuanced, and stealth ways narcissists maneuver. Desperate to align with kind people of character, we fell for the insidious ploy of conspicuous goodness and moral superiority. Like magnets, we gravitated toward, the who, toward those who strategically behaved altruistically and morally so as to gain the upper hand. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, we did. Those of us who were raised by narcissistic parents, by cluster B parents, were constantly attuned to what our parent wanted to hear, how we had to perform for them. Um, and because love was not given freely, it was not given unconditionally. If we got it, it was because we did the right thing and we did successfully avoided a punishment. Many of us come out of childhood looking for love, looking for love, not just romantic love, but platonic love, spiritual love, social love, the kinds of things that we didn't get either in our houses, because that's not who our parents were, and also probably because we were not part of communities that gave us that either. Many of us kids from households like mine had a hard time making friends. We were odd, we were weird. Our brains were split in a certain way, you know? 
what went on at home was very different from what we saw in the outside world. And it was sometimes hard to take off one set of clothes and wear the other one. So, you know, we didn't have those easy, comfortable lives comparatively that we saw some of our friends having. We didn't get socialized into healthy peer groups and and healthy communities. So we continue to look for that and we fall prey to these people who look like a source of love and kindness and goodness to us until the mask slips. I want to show you a tweet. I know I do a lot of social media on here, but because it's it's just easy pickings. I mean, you can find something that is representative of what you see in the broader society and how you've seen people act around you. All you have to do is open up Twitter. It's right there. So there was a tweet that caught my eye, and then I ended up reading the entire thread, of course. And... This has been especially prominent in COVID. These are people who love sickness. They absolutely love sickness and plague and death. Why? Because they get to be Florence Nightingale. They get to be Clara Barton. They get to heal people. And they get to emote for you. They get to show you how much they care. They get to be fragile and cry and need special support because only somebody of such an exalted character as she has could hold the hand of the dying and put herself through that terrible pain of of helping hospice patients or helping dying patients. And don't get me wrong, (laughs) I'm cynical. I was gonna say, don't think I'm cynical. I am cynical, but I'm also realistic. Um, There are a lot of good people These are things that we need people to do. The dying do need comfort. They do need aid. They do need company. Um, And there are a lot of very, very good people in nursing and doctoring and the helping professions. Most of the people are good people, fortunately. But there is a significant minority who are not in it for the patients or the people in need. They're in it for themselves. They're in it for the performance that they can generate so that you applaud them. And this is an example. So this is, I have no idea who this person is, um, but she talks a lot about how much good she does. Look at the good she does. This nurse who says, we stood outside the room watching our coworker hold the hand of our young dying COVID patient. We didn't have the time, but somehow a group of us stood crying outside the door until the heart stopped. It was sad, yes, but we all really just needed a cry. This is a nightmare. (laughs) Give me a break, Annie Wilkes. Yeah, Annie Wilkes. That bright, chipper, cockadoody affectation that you sometimes see in people like this, drives me up the wall. But this maudlin, you know, we didn't have the time, but somehow we stood there, even though we didn't have the time, somehow. And then there was a follow-up tweet, I forgot to pull it for you, but she kept going in this sappy vein and said, um, what was it that she said? Um, We're trying to be okay. We're not okay. <laughs> Ugh. Ugh. Save me from Hallmark card sentimentality. There's been so much of this. And we, collectively, our society, we have been encouraging this. They're playing to us. You know, remember um, in the earlier part of the pandemic, when everybody was, I I know this is a bigger thing in the UK, but it was going on in the US too. But in the UK, every night, what was it? Seven or eight at evening where everybody would clap for carers, clap for the NHS. And people would stand outside of their doorsteps on the street, clapping their hands or banging on a fucking pot. (laughs) I mean, you think those annoying singing bowls will get you then? Try people 
with a bunch of all clad and a wooden spoon going <coughs> woo woo carers woo ah uh, it it it's it's maudlin. Frankly, I was surprised to see the Brits do it because they like to affect that they keep a stiff upper, stiff upper lip. But I think this is, I think what's happened in Great Britain is what the eminent historian David Starkey, who was also canceled, but he's back now. If you like David Starkey and his work, he's done an on-camera interview for an hour for the first time since he was canceled for saying something naughty. He calls this the Dianification of England, Diana Spencer, Princess Diana. And I think he's absolutely right. It's something turned in the British public. The stiff upper lip was gone and sentimentality and mawkishness were all the rage. The acres and acres of flowers at the gates of Buckingham Palace, the wailing and weeping in the streets. I'm embarrassed that I remember, I remember exactly where I was when Princess Diana died. Because in those days, I was young, I was a college student, um, very self-absorbed, unstable, and pretty narcissistic myself. Um, and I just loved any of this kind of melodrama. And I remember being outside of an AM PM mini market when I heard the news over the radio, I was picking up a six pack of beer with, uh, with a friend of mine so ridiculous that I re should remember where I was because it wasn't like I was a really a huge fan of uh, of Princess Diana, but that seems to to be what has happened, and this has been carried over and amplified by media hosts, people on the news. Um, we have deified Anthony Fauci here in the United States, despite the how wrong he's been on so many things, despite how dictatorial his attitude has been. Um, let me show you another example because it just keeps going and going and going. So this next one is from, who is this from? <laughs> I think it might be from the same nurse. And again, this is a representative sample. Think of this as an appetizer platter. This is an amuse-bouche for you guys because you can find just absolute tons of this online. It's everywhere. So she goes on, our, our critical care nurse. I love you. The way my dying patient's wife spoke those words took my breath away. The pause between each word, the emphasis on each word as if willing him to feel the power the pain, the emotion. It was as if it was a plea and a fact at the same time. I never know quite how to, <laughs> I never know quite how to characterize this. I, you know, as I'm talking to you, and of course I'm not talking to you, you're not in front of me. There's just a camera in front of me and a microphone. But I, I, I feel like I'm in conversation with you and I, I'm never quite sure whether I've got the audience or not. And I wonder, do you fall for this? And actually, I shouldn't even say it that judgmentally because I used to fall for this stuff too. But if you do find this authentic, if you are a little put off by the catty way that I talk about it, um, I'm... <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. This is not authentic. This isn't real emotion. This is histrionics. This is covert narcissism. I've talked before about how people will deliberately don costumes. They'll put, the wolf will put on the sheep's clothing in order to get in with the livestock. That's why there's a fairy tale about it. Go to your fairy tales, folks. They have all the answers to life. Nothing new under the sun. But people will not only wear costumes, it's theatrical, right? They will wear costumes, they'll do themselves up in a certain way to give you a certain appearance to put you at ease. But they will also take on careers, appointments, um, positions of power that function as costumes. So the classic example of this is 
all the predatory pedophile men who went to the trouble of going to seminary, getting an education, and being ordained in the priesthood, specifically so that they would have access to young children to molest. We now know this is a thing. This doesn't shock people anymore. It did when the sex abuse scandals in the Catholic Church first became big news. People had a very hard time with this, specifically because they couldn't imagine nice old Father O'Malley. No, he's a priest. A priest wouldn't do that. A priest would never do that. I wasn't there, but I have Irish friends, and, and they tell me that as difficult as it was for American Catholics to accept the reality uh, of what was going on here, it was even harder for Irish Catholics. They just simply did not want to believe it. And that's exactly why people do this. Like, when we talk about, when women talk about the, the way that predatory men with a sexual fetish the autogynophiles that I've mentioned before, they call themselves trans, but what, but what many of them have is a condition called autogynophilia, which means love of the self as a woman. It is an erotic fetish. They, ha they get sexual gratification from seeing themselves as having a woman's body. They fetishize themselves and they make themselves into a parody and a facsimile of a woman. It's a sexual fetish, it's a perversion. You can do whatever you want in your own bedroom as long as I don't find out about it because I don't want to find out about it. I don't want you to know what I do in my bedroom and, and I don't want to know what you do in yours. So yeah, yeah, I'm judgy, but I'm not actually trying to tell people what they can and can't do, but for God's sake, keep it private. But there is no private anymore. There's no boundary between public and private. Half of the gay pride, no, more than half, almost all of gay pride celebrations these days, first of all, aren't even gay. They're LGBTQ, lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, queer. They are perversion on parade. Look at some of the photographs that you see of pride festivals. I started going to them in the early 1990s. Actually, the first one I went to was 1989 and I was way, way too young to be there. I shouldn't have been there, but it was 1989 in New York City. I was 15 years old. And it was the 20th anniversary of the Stonewall riots. And there was a lot of cutting up and sexual play going on there, you know, men groping each other in public, but it wasn't nearly what it is now. You look at photographs from Pride festivals now, you've got people in basically leather straps that are barely covering anything. Half the time their cocks are hanging out and they're walking other men who are done up in leather pieces to make them look like puppies with dog ears and they're walking them on leashes and things that are even more vile than that. This is just normal now. So the pushback you get when you point out to people that this is not about, um, it's not about living your true authentic self. It's not about, um, of, uh, coming out and getting over discrimination and simply wanting to be comfortable in your own skin. It's about violating boundaries. This trans project is about violating boundaries, particularly men violating women's boundaries, men and boys violating girls' boundaries. They want access to the rape shelter. They want access to the girls' locker room. They want access to the girls' sports team. They want to be picked and appointed to women's positions on political panels. They want to replace women. Everything that women have, they want for their own, and they want those women to stop existing. And people, especially liberals who have not yet woken up, are scandalized to hear somebody say something that I just said like that. How could you think that of them? How could you think that? They're just, they're just trying to live as their true and authentic selves. And what, what do they say? Who would go to all the trouble of transitioning just to get a sexual thrill, why would anyone put that much work into it? I'll tell you why. First of all, because what trouble? What all that trouble? The vast majority of so-called trans women, including people you know, and people who are in your state house, and people that you are tearfully voting for in Congress, they haven't done anything to their body. They haven't had breast implants. They haven't had what's euphemistically called bottom surgery, which is removal of the testicles and then inversion of the penis to create a faux vagina. 
Most of them haven't done anything to their body. They're wearing falsies, makeup, and a party store wig. Yeah. Do you think these trans women that you know have all gone through sex change surgery? If you do, you are badly misinformed. That's what it was 25 or 30 years ago. It hasn't been that way for a long time. These guys are playing you, and they're playing you with cheap thrift store clothing. Cheap thrift store drag. Now I'm going to show you a little video. Right now, I should have toddled up the numbers before I came on today, but right now... There are bills in many states around the country to protect women's sports, girls' sports, from incursions by boys who claim that they are girls. And these boys, these teenage boys, they are still adolescents. They're still victims. They're victims of this ideology and they're victims of their parents. This explosion in young people identifying as the other sex. There's nothing natural about this. This isn't that we're suddenly just discovering what was there all along. Like people used to say about gay people have always existed. It's just that they weren't legally allowed to say it. There was some truth to that. Trans people have not always existed. That's not true. Yes, there have always been a few rare cases of people with an extraordinary delusion that believed that they were born in the wrong body and who and with great psychiatric suffering. That is true. We have seen that in history. But it's been a minuscule, tiny percentage, nowhere near the numbers of people who are claiming trans identity now. And so these boys, insofar as they are victims of this ideology that's making money hand over fist in hormone treatments, surgical options, the millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars that are pouring into charities that used to stick up for gays and lesbians, like GLAD, the gay and lesbian, I can't remember what it, um, something defense, I can't believe I can't even remember what the acronym is, is spelled out, the ACLU, the millions of dollars they're making in donations by crying the sob story about how put upon trans people are and how they're, the ACLU is lying. They're all over social media talking about hateful, so-called hateful bills in legislatures that are banning trans children from participating in school sports. And they put it in that language. Such and such a state just signed into law a ban that excludes trans children from participating in sports. That is a lie. That is a lie. It's not shading the truth. It's not misleading. It's a flat lie. Trans children can participate in school sports as the sex that they are biologically, as it always has been. But that doesn't bring the dollars in, does it? No, they have to come up with a tragedy for it. So how are they doing this, these advocates? Let's look at this 45 second clip from the Texas um, legislature's House Education Committee debating a bill that would mandate something we would not have had to write into law five years ago, that no boys can't play on the girls' sports team and go into the girls' locker room. So let's listen to this. This is I, think a, I want us all to be aware of is that, that modern science obviously recognizes that there are many more than two biological sexes. In fact, there are six, <laughs> which... Honestly, Representative Hefner surprised me too. With you now. Uh, surprised me too because I, I, you know, am not well versed in this, this issue area. I'm not a scientist. I'm a politician. A lot worse than a scientist. Um, who cannot be here today, and several scientific studies proving that the male advantage is immutable, and that there in fact are two sexes. They are dimorphic X X X Y. The other quote sexes mentioned are disorders of sexual development that are variants of X X or X Y chromosome. They are still disorders of male or female. Thank. You. <sighs> that is an example of this is how liberals are these days this this um 
That man was Representative James Tallarico in the Texas House, who, according to his biographical material, has a master's in education policy from Harvard. Kel surprise. Masters in education policy. There's always been a problem with the with the schools of how how do how I want to say this? Advanced degrees in the field of so-called education have always been a problem. There's always been a, a lot of Mickey Mouse courses in there, you know, thinking that you can get a doctorate in in how to educate people rather than being an actual expert in a subject matter with experience in teaching students. Never really washed with me. But it's, it's worse than useless now, these degrees. Absolutely worthless. And that phony self-deprecation. Well, I'm, I'm not very educated in this issue area. I half expected him to talk about circling back and touch points and bullshit like that. I'm a politician. I'm even worse than a politician. <laughs> I don't know this man. This is the first time I've heard him speak. But what I do know about him is that he is willing to sit there in the Texas House and advocate for a bill that will allow biological boys to participate in girls' sports at the expense of girls, at the expense of their privacy in the locker room, and at the expense of a fair competition of girl against girl, woman against woman. The boys are going to beat them every time. Oh, well, what about these poor trans girls? What about the goddamn girls? What about them? Why is nobody asking these girls what they think? Why aren't their interests important? Why is it fair for them to give up the prospect of meddling in their sport because a boy is going to take it? Why do they have to worry about getting undressed? Adolescent girls, teenage girls with a boy in the locker room. What is going on here? And this guy presents himself to you as this wonderful, warm-hearted father and um, just a humble politician. I don't know the guy. I haven't seen enough of him to say whether there's a pattern of behavior, but this is covert narcissism, this behavior. And people who are not full-fledged, personality-disordered narcissists can also engage in this kind of behavior. All of us. Narcissism, as I've said before, almost all of the personality disorder traits are actually human traits. They're not things that only personality disordered people ever do. The difference is, is there a pattern? Is it constant? Is it pervasive in in all different areas of their lives, their personal relationships, their work relationships? Um, Is it excessive Um, and does it lead to dysfunction and distress? All of us can behave narcissistically. All of us can behave in an emotionally immature fashion. And people of genuine goodwill can be and are frequently taken in by these positivity cults. The cult of transgenderism. It's just about protecting vulnerable kids that everybody wants to throw away. So I have no idea who James Tallarico is as a person over time. But this is definitely covert narcissism is what has been getting trans under the crack in the door and opening that door wide up. We're going to take a break and then we'll come back. Hey, listeners, guess what? We're on Patreon now. Bringing you this show costs money. Would you chip in to help? Go to patreon.com slash disaffected. That's patreon.com forward slash D-I-S-A-F-F-E-C-T-E-D. Thank you. Welcome back, Masketarians. Yes, we're going to talk more about masks. I know it comes up on this show often, but my God, can we, everything is about masks. Have you noticed that as the number of COVID infections, the number of COVID cases, and the number of COVID deaths have been declining, that the propaganda about mask wearing is increasingly shrill and increasingly desperate because I've noticed it. As I've told you before, 
in the socialist state of Vermont where I live, I, I'm telling you, I see people now. I was cynical slash realistic before this. I am far, far more cynical now than I was before. I am genuinely afraid of people that I used to call friends. I'm afraid of my neighbors. I'm afraid of people in the grocery store. I know who these people are because they've showed me. We are living in Salem in the 17th century. We are. We are living in the Stepford Wives. We are living in invasion of the body snatchers. People are monitoring you to check your compliance. Here in Vermont, even still, we're almost into May. The sun is out, it's beautiful. Again, I know I've said this before, but I'm gonna tell you every time it happens. Again, I'm down on Church Street, our main street downtown, the other day. And every single person I walked by, save for one other family, one mom, one dad, and their toddler, those three people and me, we were the only people on this outdoor promenade without masks on. People are still doing it alone in their cars. And when you turn to social media, where the the real hardcore masketarians hang out, they're beating the drum faster and faster and harder and harder. We can't stop doing this, guys. We're just trying to get back to normal. Oh, please, just do it a little while longer. Oh, we can't lose all our good progress now. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Bullshit. These people don't want to return to normal. They don't. They don't want this war to end because they are living for this. These are petty curtain twitchers and Gladys Kravitzes who are in their glory. They're busybodies in snoops and now they have pride of place in our cultural cast of characters. They love this. They get to be Snoopy. They get to be busybodies. They get to mind other people's business. They get to count how many times you're washing your hands. They get to see whether you're complying with the, I mean, the mask anymore? It's a religious garment. It's a yarmulke. It's a hijab. It's a prayer shawl. It is not anything but a symbol it's a signal of allegiance to the faith. I'll read you a little bit more from that great article by Sherry Heller. And if you happen to be watching this, um, Sherry, thank you. Great article. Really appreciated it out there. You all should look it up. The, um, the medium is the title. The Virtuous Narcissist, What Lurks Behind the Heroic Mask. So she says... The larger terrain of celebrity worship, social justice warriors, and politics is rife with virtue signalers and grandstanders. Here we see virtuous liberal plutocrats touting environmentalism, economic equality, and world peace. They talk a good game. Now they do, but you don't have to listen to it, and you don't have to take it at face value. <laughs> Check this out. So we've got, <laughs> oh, where did I put this guy? Oh, yes. This gentleman, I don't know how to pronounce his name, Roey Ruttenberg. All I know is that he describes himself as an international television news correspondent in his social media profiles. So he says this. I'm fully vaccinated and still wearing a mask and will continue to do so until the guidance changes. If people see more and more people not wearing masks, they don't know if they're vaccinated or not, they'll be less inclined to do so as well. Go, Rui. What is this about? I'm fully vaccinated and still wearing a mask and will continue to do so until the guidance changes. That right there, that's the signal of allegiance, the guidance. It's like the science. I've said this before, but I'm going to repeat it until you remember it. <laughs> People used to say, listen to science, follow science. Now they say, listen to 
the science. It's not just a little word. It's a tell. The fact that this construction takes the definite article, the, signals a shift. And it's a shift from science, understanding science for what it is, which is the the methodical investigation of the natural world and the world around us according to rules of evidence so that two people can both look at the same thing and come to some reasonably confident judgment of the objective truth. These people are treating science as a religion. When they say, listen to the science, they're saying, listen to the gospel. Listen to the word, the good word. They're speaking in religious language and they're enacting religious practices. So he's going to do so until the guidance changes. And it reminds me of something I saw in the New York Times, a headline earlier, which also brings in infantilization. And the sentence was, when do we have to wear a mask outdoors? Let me say that again. When do we have to wear a mask outdoors? And then health officials say, doesn't that sound strange to you? Did that hit your ear a little oddly? If it didn't, say it again and again until you hear it. This is how primary school teachers speak to kindergartners. When do we have to wear our masks? When is it okay for us to do X and such? This is language I have never heard from major media like the New York Times. This is different. This is a shift. And it's it's creepy. It's creepy. And and in this tweet, if people see more and more people not wearing masks, they'll be less inclined to do so as well. <laughs> yeah. Why are you frightened of this, Rui? Why are you worried about this? I'll tell you why. This guy doesn't give a shit about the nonsense he's saying. I have no idea if he's smart enough to realize that the mask, especially outdoors, is probably not doing very much. But it's not about that for him. He wants to be seen by you to be the good guy. He wants to be seen by you to be in compliance. He's part of the establishment. He's on the side of right and good. He's on the right side of history. And you blaspheming anti-maskers out there are going to be on the wrong side of history if they have anything to say about it. So I, I it it's just disturbing. He's willing to continue wearing the mask just so that he can give a signal to other people so they won't stop wearing their masks. And it's people like me saying outrageous things. Mm. Let's move on to Dr. Samantha Bat Rodden. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Another tweet. For those of you listening, I'll read the tweet, but there's an image in this tweet. There was a very big protest about a week ago. Um, I believe outside London. It was certainly in the UK. Um, I don't know how many people were there because the media won't tell us. I listened to some podcasters uh, who actually were there and, and tried to do a rough estimate. Um, and they were talking tens of thousands of people um, in their count had walked by where they were sitting on this um, demonstration route. These people are holding signs. They're all packed together. Um, we are free. Take your mask off, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the image accompanying this tweet. And Dr. Samantha Bat Rodden, um, <laughs> I've got to describe this for you listeners as well. Um, in her name, um, as it's displayed in her, in her Twitter profile, She's got, of course, the ubiquitous blue check, so that means she's a real person and important. But she's also got a little heart, a little heart emoji, 
She cares. She super, super cares. She's your mommy. Hearts, bunnies, rainbows, infantilization, mommy tone. So she says, I'll be honest, as an ICU doctor, this actually makes me want to cry. A gut punch for NHS staff everywhere tonight. I'm gutted. I'm gutted with a sad face. Okay, I'm taking this earpiece off right in front of y'all because I don't need it anymore. And it's driving me nuts, so you don't have to watch me squirm anymore. I'm gutted. A gut punch for NHS NHS staff everywhere tonight. I'm gutted. This really has pissed me off. The way medical professionals, narcissistic, self-regarding, self-promoting medical professionals have gotten on television and online and in newspapers for a year, basically carrying a sign that says, hero, 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 hero. I mean, they have no shame whatsoever. They have no dignity, no shame at all. They're self-aggrandizing right in front of you. But, but, the, but it's not right in front of you, is it? Because a lot of people fall for this. They see the white coat. They see the stethoscope. They see the, the doctor and the letters after his name or her name. And they just say, is good, is good man, wants to help me. Huh, no. They want to control you. Doctors are necessary. I shouldn't have to say this. If it weren't for doctors, I wouldn't be alive. I had a heart attack at 36 years old. Modern medicine saved my life. They got in there within half an hour to 45 minutes of the onset of symptoms, had actually opened up a blockage in my right coronary artery and placed a stent in there to keep it open. They stopped the heart attack. Thank you. I have a cardiology team. I see a cardiologist once a year. You know, I like doctors. But like most things, I like them in their place. And their place is in doctoring and, and the doctor-patient relationship. And it's, it's not to be making public policy. It is to be advising our political leaders and us about their medical opinion, what they think is most likely to happen in X situation, what is not likely to happen, what is risky, what is not risky. We take this on board. People forget this too. The doctor-patient relationship is not a parent-child relationship. When you go to your doctor and you seek her advice, you are free to disregard that advice. She does not get to make that decision for you. You are not being bad if you dis. You may be being unwise, but sometimes you're being wise. I've gotten some very bad medical advice that I did not follow, and it turned out that I was right not to follow it. I've gotten a lot of very good medical advice that's helped me too. I get to make that decision. You as a patient get to make that decision. This is why we have a president, not a doctor in charge. This is why we have a cabinet of advisors Scientists, doctors, political theorists, generals, all of these people have important experience, education, and professional knowledge that we need to listen to and evaluate in order to make the best public policy decisions we can. But they are not the president and they are not our elected representatives. We do not owe them obedience and fealty. And when they get above their station, we are allowed to put them back down in their station. And that is what we're not doing in this country. One more from Dr. Bat Rodden. Talk about covert nar Yeah, so how does this tie into covert narcissism? This is obvious to me, okay? I know you can't see it. And even if you're looking at this, um, it's not a very good image and you can't really see it. But this woman is all tells on social media. Just her her profile picture screams narcissistic traits to me. She's standing, she's giving you a three quarter profile. Lipstick is just perfect. She's pretty and she knows it. And she's looking at, she's looking in three quarters profile 
with frankly a, a slightly saucy look in her eyes, like a. Hmm. Hmm. I mean, she she clearly thinks very highly of herself and expects you to think highly of her too. I don't like her. I don't like anything about her. She screams, vain poser to me. And no surprise, because as I started looking past that original tweet that I pulled for this show, I realized I have seen her before. <laughs> her pinned tweet, meaning on her Twitter page, the tweet that she put out that she thinks best represents herself, that she pins to the top so that you can always see it. I remember this. I remember seeing it. She says, it happened. It finally happened. A man talked down to me about my specialist subject. He quoted a paper. I wrote the damn paper. Small victories. Bullshit. This, this is narcissism that calls itself feminism. Okay? Whether or not you are a feminist, whether or not you agree with this school of feminism or that school of feminism, there are schools of feminism that are actually concerned with women's interests, women's rights, making sure that women are not hampered by discriminatory laws or practices that favor men unjustly. And there's a lot of stuff called feminism today, which is just female narcissism, covert narcissism. Not very covert to me anymore, but very covert to a lot of people and very covert to a lot of women because they see the doctor and their defense is lower because she's wearing a costume. Yeah, I know she's actually a doctor, but she's wearing a doctor costume in the way she carries herself. And she's gutted, just gutted. And this kind of, what is, what am I looking for? It's the kind of feminism that talks about girl boss, girl bosses. You know, I'm a badass bitch. Ain't no man gonna best me. In another time, in places where I've seen women mistreated and I have seen them mistreated, Sexism is real. Some men are terrible about it. But times have changed. And I don't believe that we are living in a society that is institutionally or systemically misogynist, as they claim, any more than we're living in a society that is institutionally and systemically racist. What I mean is not that sexism doesn't exist, not that racism doesn't exist, not that homophobia doesn't exist. These things will always be with us. Not everybody's going to like us and some people are going to dislike us for bad reasons and they're going to overstep their bounds and mistreat us in unjust ways. That will always be true. But institutionally racist, right down into our bones so that every single transaction that goes on between a white person and a black person is tinged with submerged simmering white power sentiment or every interaction between a man and a woman is governed by rules of sex no not just sexism misogyny sexism has been inflated to misogyny hatred of women it's gotten to the ridiculous point that merely disagreeing with women like this and they make a great living for themselves on social media merely disagreeing with them you are called a misogynist you, you hate women, you don't ever listen to them, you're disagreeing with them simply because it's a woman. I don't believe any of this nonsense. So yeah, I see these patterns and I see people like this and I don't think we're dealing with people who are just along for the ride and haven't woken up yet. I think we're looking at the ringleaders. And I wanna close with one more quote from that great article by Sherry Heller. To see clearly the machinations of virtue signaling and grandstanding, we need to be willing to employ critical thinking. Objectively analyzing and evaluating an individual's conduct 
requires us to establish moral standards to which we hold others accountable. Yes. And the key point there is moral standards and and agreeing that there are standards of behavior that matter. It means putting down moral relativism. If you've heard that phrase before, you probably have heard it spoken by people that you consider Christians derisively, right? Oh, this is just what right-wing fundamentalist Christians say. They say what's wrong with our society is, is moral relativism. They just mean they don't like plurality. They don't like multiculturalism. Well, there are people like that who say that for those reasons, but not nearly so many as we've been told. And I don't care if they're fundamentalist Christians, if they are saying that moral relativism is a path to hell, they're absolutely right. I have this conversation with my therapist. I've had it, I've had it going on for a couple of years now, and um, I sometimes ask him what he thinks, what ails us in this particular way? Where are we going wrong here that we ended up where we are? And it often comes down to, in his words, moral relativism. The idea that there is no such thing as good behavior and bad behavior or healthy behavior and unhealthy behavior, but it's just that whatever it is that makes you feel good is the right thing. That's hedonism. That's narcissism. It's addictive behavior. And you can't run a society that way. I think we need to rescue some of the terms that we have felt like we've lost to the very hardest right-wing fundamentalist people. Words like morality. Morality, to me, doesn't mean what a particular God figure wants. It doesn't mean well, this behavior is bad or this, this kind of food is forbidden because a God said so on the page of this book. For some people, that is what it means, right? And they may have that. But morality is not just something that strictly religious people or even fundamentalist religious people have made up. Morality is, is something that concerns all humans. Moral relativism, the idea that any way to live is just fine as long as it's what everybody else is doing, or whatever gives you instant gratification in the moment is is poison. It leads to, it doesn't actually lead to self-esteem. It leads to treating the world and your pleasures like addictions. And you need more and more and more and more because it's never enough. We need to rescue morality from that artificially narrow definition. And we need to stop pretending that things like multiculturalism or a plurality of views are synonyms for moral relativism. They're not. Some behavior is not merely culturally different, it's destructive. And I don't care if it comes within our culture or from outside of our culture. Standards matter. Human beings are the same kinds of creatures that we have been for very many hundreds of thousands and millions of years. We have the same foibles. We have the same good qualities. We have the same tendencies towards self-destruction and destruction of others that we have ever had. And modern 21st century Westerners seem to think that we have somehow outgrown humanity and we can just pick from a sampler platter of any pleasure we want, regardless of the consequences to other people and regardless of the consequences and the eventual cost to ourselves. We can't. And I think we need to talk about it more. That's the show. Thank you and I'll see you next time.
Hey listeners, guess what? We're on Patreon now. Bringing you this show costs money. Would you chip in to help? Go to patreon.com slash disaffected. That's patreon.com forward slash D-I-S-A-F-F-E-C-T-E-D. Thank you. Would you take just a minute right now and share our show on social media? On Disaffected, we take a close look every week at the abuse dynamics exploding in the dark and disordered world that we live in. Tell other people about us. And when you subscribe, hit that notification bell and stay with us in real time as we take a new close look every week and examine how to identify and contend with the abuse dynamics at play in the world around us.